space? Uh, yes, uh, by necessity, because often the caves are very wet and it's hard to write, uh, partly because it's hard to write in the dark, but also because paper just perishes uh, when you're climbing through waterfalls. And... Um, and it's also a voice print, you know, that you get a, a kind of a sense of the acoustic. So recording a um, small dictaphone was a way of kind of hearing the cave as well as my voice. Because it reverberates back to you. Yeah, and even very small enclosed spaces, some spaces are very intimate. And the Mendip Caves, there are caverns, huge caverns, but there are also a lot of very intimate spaces where you're crawling on your, your belly through the mud. You, so... In that sense, you, there's a huge range of acoustics. So you're like a kind of muttering golem. I'm, I'm <laughs> famous for being a muttering caver. Yeah. <laughs> More on that. Uh, Ruth Whitehouse, you've studied caves in Italy, some of which clearly were used for ritualistic purposes mm. over thousands of years. And like Sean, you too noticed this peculiar acoustic. Yes, indeed. Um, I mean, all the senses are, uh, are remarkably affected when you go into one of these caves, but sound is very um, does stand out in some ways, um, partly because it is so variable. You get these different effects. There are sort of largish chambers where it reverberates round and you can't really work out where it's coming from if it's not yourself. Um, but there are other places where um, if you've got a colleague in a small side chamber, it's very close in terms of distance, but you can't hear him or her at all. Um, so it really it contributes as the effects on all the other senses to a, a really disorientating effect. That does sound very unnerving. <laughs> um, luckily, I can hear you all beautifully in our studio. But Paul, Paul Pettit, Sean and Ruth have been listening in the dark, but as a paleoarchaeologist and a cave art specialist, do you think it's possible for us even to begin to envisage in our brightly lit world just how dark dark was? It is difficult, isn't it, uh, in that uh, there's so much light pollution and when we do uh, venture into the darkness, usually our way is lit by electric light and uh, I think that's the main way in which we uh, are distanced from this uh, prehistoric world in that uh, the light we bring with us is still, we can look at the art in a way it was never seen uh, in in the past because, uh, of course, the only sources of light then were flickering lights, small lamps lamps, little hearths lit on the floors of the caves, so the art would be dim and it would be constantly shifting from the point of view of the viewer. You make that sound very evocative. And for all of you, in all of your work, the past is made present for our inspection. But it seems to me there are problems with this idea too. And I want to ask our diggers, uh, Paul, Ruth and Francis, first about this. Because archaeologists make the past tangible, and I'm assuming you work with this premise that we understand ourselves by excavating our history. But is there a danger that we end up patronising the past from our position of technological progress? I think there's a very real danger, um, particularly, I think, because we have our hard and fast attitudes to our surroundings. So, for example, it's OK now, in fact, you must do it, to build on brownfield sites because they were the sites of nasty factories and places like that where ordinary working-class people got their hands dirty. The fact that that actually gave us our prosperity to have these toffee-nosed attitudes is neither here nor there. And, um, you know, uh, we must treat old factory sites and things like that with the same respect we accord to churches. What, what do you think, Paul? Are we, do we, are we in danger of patronising the past? Yes, we are. I think the more distant prehistoric societies are in time, uh, the easier it is to, to write them off, to generalise about them, and in so doing, uh, patronise them. We all speak about cavemen, cave women, uh, and this sort of thing without realising that they were as sophisticated uh, as us. And I think even art historians may have a patronising view of what is something like 80% of art uh, from, from the Paleolithic. In other words, strange beginnings, odd daubs on the walls of caves in the darkness we don't really understand. Let's move on to something more akin to Western art. Francis, another thing we tend to think that happened in a relentlessly progressive linear fashion is this long move towards the kind of centralised society that we recognise today. But in your era, in your, your area, mm. that transition from Neolithic to Bronze Age, one thing that happens is that big stone circle culture comes to a relatively abrupt end. And you have an idea that that has something to do with the rise of population, which means that culture becomes local and diverse in ways that we know. 
Yes, I mean, I think what we're looking at is the development of the landscape. You know, it's been happening, you know, trees had been felled, roads were being built and so on from about 4000 BC in, in a fairly big way. And then about 1500 BC, so it's the time of Tutankhamun, um, in, the, in the Bronze Age, there was an abrupt change. Places like Stonehenge and Avebury, the great stone monuments, were abandoned. And people instead switched to more locally based religions. And I think what you're looking at there, you know, with people making offerings to water and that sort of thing, is the beginning of what was later to turn into the parish system. It's the beginnings of local government and local governance. And, you know, I think if you'd been around in the late Bronze Age, you'd have been completely at home. You really would. That's such a surprising thing to think, isn't it? Because that past feels remote and um, alien in some ways. People like me, Paul and Ruth, we, we gawp with wonder at the, the cave paintings, at the 30,000-year-old bison in the caves of Altamira and the 20,000-year-old bulls on the walls of Lascaux in France. But is it patronising of us to think of those as examples of so-called primitive art? Because as Francis is suggesting here... Th those people were like us in all but the technology. Yes, um, I think in terms of the Western art concept of primitive art, you know, the, the, the modern movement, it would be a mistake to think of it like this because uh, it was sophisticated, it was well designed, it had significant message and so on. It's not consciously harking back to anything more primitive. Uh, but in the sense of the art of modern small-scale societies observable by anthropologists over the last couple of centuries, or so, then yes, it functions in a very similar way. It is not an art there primarily to entertain, uh, to decorate and so on. It is there uh, fully embedded in society, has a role, has, if you like, an agency. It acts on behalf of its creators and viewers. So in that sense, an anthropological sense, it's a primitive art. Is that your sense too, Ruth? Yes, I, I'd agree with that. And um, uh, bringing in sort of modern small-scale societies is... a um, is bringing in an example of another lot of people we tend to patronise, mm. and we we try very mm. hard these days to use, to avoid using terms like primitive and so yes. on. Um, but it's still there in people's mindset, and um, um, actually, the more you study them, the more you get to admire what yeah. they could do and uh, and did achieve.